This is Mr. Sean Bailey. This man is one of the candidates for Mayor of London, and Sean has come down here to answer a few questions. We have hooked up the inside of this cab to take Sean out on the road. Uh, we're going to drive down a couple of streets because I want to physically take Sean on the road, show him uh, the limitations with the current policies, how it affects us, and I want to ask him specific questions in specific areas. Let's see how we get on, and let's hope when this gets out, uh, we have a reply from the current mayor, and then he comes down and he can also tell us, because that will make it fair. This is one of my new Scania's. I'm going to show you what it's like to be out on the road in one of these. It's great being in this lorry, really high up, and it just yeah. it just reminds you what a responsibility is driving. Oh, it's a, a huge vehicle. responsibility driving this. Yeah. So to get started, Sean, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us where you're from. I'm a Londoner. I was born in West London, lived there most of my life. I now live in East London. I'm married. I have two kids. My wife's called Ellie. My son is called Joshua and my daughter's called Aurora. I only happened into politics because I used to be a youth worker. I've been a youth worker for over 20 years. I ran my own charity. I worked for other charities as well. But I've always been interested in helping people move forward. And I came from Labra Grove, which is very poor. So you're from Labra Grove? Yeah, I'm a Grove boy. I went to St. Charles in Labra Grove. I went to St. Charles Sixth Form College. I used to live on the Ava Road, just away from um, St. Oh, Charles. Small world. It's called Chesterton Road. I used to live there, you'll know it. But I, I, I was born in that area, I grew up, and you probably know then, it, it's, it's quite a rough area. Lots, mm -hmm. lots of the worst things happen there. It's lots of the best things as well, but growing up, I spent a lot of time avoiding crime. I grew up with a bunch of boys as well who, who got in a fair amount of trouble. Okay. But as I got older, I got involved in gymnastics and army cadets and all those things and started to have a different horizon. Gymnastics? Yeah. Now, now tell us about the gymnastics. Was that, um, was that you did gymnastics because you like gymnastics or did you do the gymnastics like Jean-Claude Van Damme because you like giving people high kicks and stuff like that? I like it... gymnastics. I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite a physical person. When I was younger, I was, I was hyper fit. I was lucky. I wasn't that good in school. Okay. But they taught me how to focus. Cadets taught me how to focus. And eventually I got all the way to university, did a degree in computer-aided engineering. Okay. And then I, I came back to my area and some people I know had, had been in some serious stuff. People have been murdered and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I really got into the youth work and I, I'd already started youth work when I was younger. But a man called Baron, he's my best friend's dad actually, a guy called Scott. He said to me, come and do youth work, you'll like it, you can make a difference. So I started working and then eventually I set up my own programme because I'm desperate to get people not to go into the life. You, you know what I'm saying? It was, really? Yeah, there was a lot of people who thought gang involvement was a way forward. So yep. I set up a charity, we did lots of work from that. And then years after I'd been running a charity, I, I spoke at an event and David Cameron was there. So someone said to David Cameron, you've got to hear Sean speak. So he came and he spoke and he said, you're just what I'm looking for. Really? Yeah, to okay. be a Tory MP. And you can imagine, let, yeah. let me tell you how it was going. That morning, I'd had, a, I'd had a punch up with a drug dealer in the car park. You had a punch up with a drug, okay, in the car yeah, park, yeah, yeah okay. He was trying to sell some stuff to some boys I was looking after us and it, yeah. you know, he, he tried to hit me, so I had to defend myself. Yeah. And then that afternoon, David Cameron said to me, I should consider being a Tory MP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could imagine how that conversation went. I literally yeah. said, because I thought it was funny, don't call us, we'll call you. Yeah. He laughed, I laughed, I went my way. But when I went back and I told the boys I was working with, yeah. they were furious. I expected oh, really? them to laugh like I did. Yeah. They were like, but Sean, you spent all this time preaching to us about how to take an opportunity. Yeah. Someone presents you one and you walk away. And I felt bad. I felt, you know what, they're right. Yeah. And I always try to sort of practice what I preach. Yeah. So I got back in touch. I went through the motions and I stood in Hammersmith and, you know, I didn't win, but David Cameron, was very good actually to his word. He said yeah. to me, okay, you didn't win, but come and be a special advisor to me. Oh, wow. And, and what did you advise David Cameron on? On, I did youth, crime, poverty, that kind of stuff. I did a little bit of a, on adoption as well, because he was passionate about changing the adoption laws. But what was really nice, I, I remember the day he rang me, um, his office rang me and said, look, um, the Prime Minister wants to offer you this position. I rang my mum, yeah. and I said to my mum, pack your bags, we're off to number 10. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it was really yeah. nice to say that to my mum. She laughed, we cried, and then I went to number 10 and started working. It was good fun. Well, and how many years were you at number 10? I was at number 10 for about two years. Mm -hmm. Then I went to the cabinet office mm -hmm. to set up NCS. So NCS is the biggest youth programme this country's ever done. I think by this point, over 600,000 young people have been through it. And then I went to the education department after that to be an expert advisor there. Wow, okay. So from that transition from number 10, what 
inspired you? Why, why Mayor of London? I think for me, my whole thing is, I want people who've had an ordinary life, we know what it's like. I was homeless for a long time. I was unemployed as well for a little while. Okay. And I want people who've had those experiences to be at the top table making decisions. I know, for instance, you add 10 pounds to my weekly bills, that could wipe me out. Yeah. And I want that kind of experience to be involved in politics. That's why I got involved. Okay. And, I, and I also want to show people you could be from a, a poor background, single parent background, you could be black, white, whatever it is, you still have the right to be involved in running this country. And I wanted to demonstrate that to people. I, I don't want to bore people with politics, but Sadiq Khan has failed. In London, we have a record amount of murder. We've had a 60% rise in knife crime, an 86% rise in robbery. And I just thought enough is enough. London deserves better. We could do something about that. But it's weird to say I should be mayor of London. That isn't my emotion. My emotion is how much more could I do to help people? I don't care where the good idea is, comes from, but let's have the good idea. Let's solve this issue. It's parts of London's community that are traumatized because I've had so much murder there. If you're watching this now and you're in and around London, ask the people you know, do they know anyone who's been robbed? Just ask them that, who's been robbed, who's been mugged. Unfortunately, it happens too much. I believe we could fix these things and I have a plan to fix them. You said that you were homeless. So. I grew up in a council house, I was born in a council house, but they housed my mum, but they wouldn't house me because I was a single man. So I went out into the world, didn't quite work out, and I was sofa surfing for years. My mate Scott put me up, my mate Alex absolutely rescued me when I was at university. And I did that for probably a 10 year period. In the end, I came back to Labrick Grove and Auntie Norma, I said to her, I'll be three weeks. A year later, I was still there. <laughs> she, I mean, she really, really sorted me out. I was fortunate I had friends and family and community who could support me. Because mm -hmm. one of the other big things I want to do is reduce homelessness and not just the visible, rough sleeping, also mm -hmm. hidden homeless, people who were sofa surfing, because that was one of the toughest periods of our life. It was, it was, it was terrible. Okay, so so you're looking at homelessness from also the, the sofa surfing point of view, because even though you have somewhere to stay at that time, you are still technically homeless. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I stayed on my friend's sofa, loads of friends, but, but I'm just not that cute. You got this big guy laying on your sofa. At some <laughs> point, at some point, you're like, you know what? He's got to move on. Mm. And, and that pressure was, was immense. The plan is to build 100,000 homes for 100,000 pounds so Londoners can actually afford them. 100,000 homes for 100,000 pounds. And it is doable. So the government have given us six billion pounds to do that, right? Yep. So I put in one subsidy. The person who's buying that, the, their part puts their 100,000 pounds in and then they own the home. And imagine for a second, you don't have to deal with a dodgy landlord. Imagine for a second, you can go home, shut the door and it's your home. You own a part of it and you can grow that part if you want. And imagine, right now in London, the average deposit takes 23 years to save for. Oh, wow. If I'm mayor, the average deposit will take about two years to save for, because it'll be 5,000 pounds. Do you see what I mean? And I just, want, I just want to give people the opportunity to own their own thing. And it's not my opinion, 87% of Londoners say they want to own their own home. Are you planning on getting these built through um, pushing through uh, construction or is it planning or is it is it a certain element or is it everything collectively that should help build these homes? No, it's a focused plan. So I'm going to start something called Housing for London, okay. which will be the developer and the only plan will be to build the homes, not to make any money. So I'll get builders in, I'll get developers in and I'll enter into joint ventures with them. But I will be working with people who build, not who develop. If, if you think you're going to Oh, own it, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically for me, as a contractor, yeah. I'd be someone who, who you'd look at, but someone who builds 500 flats and, and makes a lot of money, that's not a company you'd be working. You'd be working with contractors as opposed to developers. I'd work with all, but I'll flip it around and I'll start with contractors. I need people who are going to put bricks and mortar together, not people who are going to sell me expensive land, not people who are going to land bank. This is about delivery, it's about speed. And one of the problems London faces from a business point of view, a house building, we have really, really, really big developers and not much else in between. Oh. I need to help need small and medium developers because they act faster, they get paid when they actually deliver. Yep. So I want, to, I want to build a market for those companies. Let's talk about construction in general. I'll tell you my understanding of the economy, not just in London, but in the UK. For me, construction, unless I'm misinformed, construction is one of the main parts of the industry here. The concept that you're going to um, 
buy something, imagine we have an area and we create more homes, uh, we can create value in construction, and then um, that money was put into construction, the people who work in construction, they spend money, and we keep the economy going like this. This is, this is my basic understanding, in layman's terms, of construction and the UK economy. Is that correct? Let me put it to you like this. I have a plan to create 924,000 jobs in a four year period. And the way in which I'll do that is my £6 billion I'll spend on housing, my £10.9 billion I'll spend on infrastructure in London, and one of the biggest parts of that is construction. Every house you build, for instance, creates 2.4 jobs. Does so, it really? Yes, 2.4 jobs, because of all the supply lines. So right from you, from the aggregate, right up to the estate agent, it creates 2.4 jobs. So of course, if I build 100,000 homes, that creates 240,000 jobs. And wow. that's the whole point of it. So that's why you hear me say, I will support business in London because it will support employment. Every time you hear me use the word business, I'm really talking about jobs. I'm talking about jobs, okay. jobs, 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 and a realistic plan to deliver them. So you have your business, you employ people, they spend money in the economy that creates activity that makes your business busy, that gives them employment. It's a circle and we need to keep that circle going. And the way to do that is to use the money that we have collectively in London, so money we raise ourselves, money we get from the government, to use that in the most effective way to build business that keep running and running and running. Because it goes back to this. When I was homeless, one of the things that really helped me move forward is I got a job. Yeah. And I used to temp and it was, it, was, it was really, really hard, but I was meeting people, like-minded people, people were giving me more opportunities. I just want that for people at home. Now, you could be young and at that part of your career, or you could be older, but you definitely need employment. You need to be in that ecosystem to move yourself forward. I want to make that more possible for people. So, when I look at construction in 100,000 homes, that's, I'm thinking of a contractor who could possibly, like, has the resources to build like that. What about your smaller builder? What about your plumber? What about your carpenter? What about a person who just wants to do an extension on their house? Because sometimes it's very difficult with planning. People just want to do an extension or they want to do a basement or they want to do a loft conversion. What about the lower end here? Sometimes people don't want to sell their house. They want to improve, mm -hmm. not move. So how can you stimulate that? Because those smaller jobs, there are construction firms. There's a lot of people watching this, people in the trade. All these smaller jobs are on. How can you stimulate that? So let me separate out the issues you talk about. First, let's talk about the overall thing. As Mayor of London, <laughs> I'm going to reduce planning risk by being very clear about what I want for the big boys. And they can either give me what I want or they can jog on. I haven't got time to miss about. I've got to get these 100,000 homes built. If you're a smaller developer, here's the two ways in which I will help you. Three ways, really. One, I will write the London plan to change the small sites policy. Planning won't be the problem because there's many small sites in London that are not used because the planning is too complicated. I will help negotiate with local authorities and my own authority to make it happen. That's the key thing. And the other really direct piece, I'm going to form a market for smaller builders, for smaller suppliers. How do you mean form so, a market? So what Elaborate. it is now, the mayor has, has um, preferred providers, yeah? They're all huge. They're all huge. When I write the London plan, when I talk about how we use small sites, I will write it to make it easier for smaller builders to produce. Because the advantage in a, with a smaller builder is they get their money on a completion, and that's where they and I have the same goal. I want completions. Where Sadiq Khan has hugely failed, you'll hear him use this term, he's built a record amount of council homes. He has not. He has written completions on a piece of paper. How many of you can live on an A4 piece of paper? So Sadiq Khan has had an extra year yes. because of COVID and the yes. pandemic. So if you are successful in being elected, will you still have a four year term? I'd have a three year term. A three year term? How does that work? Yeah. Well, it's, it's just a legislation, but I'm confident. I'm so confident in my plan. It's been worked through with professionals. I can get the lion's share of this done in three years. And I believe that Londoners will trust me with another four years to get even more done. So you're going to have less time than any mayor in history to achieve probably a lot more than any of them have had to do in a short period of time. That's true, but I've had more chance to plan. Remember, I came from working for central government, so I have the trust of central government. So I know how to fight for London, not how to just fight with the government. I have to be honest, in, in a selfish way, I'm very concerned about construction and I'm also concerned about crime and, and I'm concerned about young people because, um, you know, the environment I grew up in, it, it appears that we, we would have crossed paths a bit. Obviously, I'm a bit younger, you can tell by the baby face. <laughs>
<laughs> but um, I'll tell you how, I, how, how crime is for me. I think about the, the people who are hurt by crime, like people being stabbed, people being shot, people being murdered. But that also has a detrimental effect on business. If we're destroying certain areas, the property values in that area, the people in there, the value of their house isn't going up, they can't sell and move to the suburbs, therefore that house can't get redeveloped, people don't want to live in certain areas. So what is your plan to tackle crime? I grew up in an environment where it's riddled with crime, drug dealing, all kinds of madness. And now, I talk to young people who won't go outside of their area because they're afraid of being attacked. There's three things we need to do with crime. Firstly, I'm going to have 8,000 extra police officers on the streets of 8,000 police 8, officers. 8,000 boots on the ground. It is a fact that the presence of the police lowers crime. I'm yeah. going to reopen the 38 police stations closed by Sadiq Khan. If you are robbed or burgled, yeah, you, you don't want to fill in a form online. You want to speak to someone. You know, we've got to show people that the police stations are live so it doesn't look like the police are in retreat. These are all the things we're working on. That's one end of it. The other end, of course, is the extreme other end. We cannot arrest our way out of this problem. So I'm going to have 4,000 youth workers across London and 32 youth zones to give our young people a safe place to be, good people to be around, and a way to learn the soft skills they need to be successful. And in the middle of that, I'm going to have a second chance fund focused on breaking the re-offending cycle. So you have a lot of young people who go in and out of jail. They learn all the madness they need to learn in jail. I want them to come out of jail, focus on them so they can get skills, so they can come into construction, they can come into accounting, whatever it is. And I want to give them access to the training and, and the college courses they need. And I will pay for that, I will sponsor that as me. And, and let's be clear, I'm going to do the stop and search properly. I'm going to get the police, the technology to do scan and search because we have to show people, if you have a weapon in London, you're going to get caught. You have to show to people, it ain't the Wild West, you can't do as you please. There is rules here, we need to keep people safe. And you say about business, you can't go to the high street if you think you're gonna get stabbed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. People won't come to London if they think London's dangerous. It's important to make London safe for everybody. And of course, one of the biggest things the mayor got wrong is when he said, right, the streets of London are no longer safe for women and girls. So what I'm gonna do, is double the size of the safeguarding unit to add an extra 500 officers to the unit that look after things like sexual assault, rape, domestic violence. So not only they can investigate and prosecute, they can also do some preventative work as well. I'm going to double the number of police um, officers on the underground system because we've had a 44% increase in sexual attacks on the underground and I'm going to get on top of that, I'm going to break that down. 44% increase in crime on the under, my mum gets on the train, man. Exactly, me, my, my, the, some of the women who work in my office have to use a tube all the time. Right. I want to get on top of that. And I'm also going to have 24 hour patrols in the areas of London where women feel the most vulnerable. Okay. It's really important to make sure that we send a message that we're looking after people on the streets of London. Sorry, I keep going back because you're saying things, I'm not aware of this, you're saying that 38 police stations are just closed? Yeah, just closed. And, and what's happening inside the police station? Well, it's most of them, there's police officers in there, but the public can't go into the front door, report something or whatever. And that's why I'm gonna reopen them. It's important that we were able to have a little relationship with our local police officers. And I believe the police wanna have that relationship as well. The problem is, if you remove the visibility of the police, that space is filled with, with street crime. You've gotta push the police back out there to remove that street crime. So basically, Bobby's on the beat. When, if and when he does turn up, ask him these questions. Ask him for numbers, not percentages. Ask him how many homes has he built? Okay. How many police officers has he paid for or the government has paid for? Don't let him bamboozle you. For instance, you talk about money he spent. In the debate we had, he said the deficit has gone down. He's brought the deficit down. But the debt, and that's what you and I will have to pay back as Londoners, is continuing to balloon. I'm referring to the debt for Transport for London. He gave a fares freeze that basically was for tourists. Now, while that's nice, it means that we're covering the bill. If you're one of the 4.5 million people who watch your, your um, travel card, your Oyster card garping cost, you know there was no fares freeze. And he did all of that. He messed up the finances and then he's giving you the bill because now he's increased council tax by 31% over his term. It's just, it's incredible. So council tax has gone up by 31%. Yeah. Travel has gone up both on the road and on the underground and the police station was closed. Yes. Now I have to I have to call you on this. Now these are facts, yeah? These I'm not gonna, facts. we're not gonna go repeating this and then I'm gonna have a backlash on yeah. the Asheville These are facts, These yeah? are facts, and, and, and check them all you want. As Mayor of London, you have a 19 billion pound budget annual 
And that's before you add in extras, you get extra money for housing, etc. What does that cover? So you're the Police and Crime Commissioner for London. You're the mm -hmm. Chairman of TfL. They're the biggies. They're the biggies. Okay. You have the Mayoral Development Company as well. You have the GLA itself. The GLA is a slightly separate body, but you are you, the Mayor has has mm -hmm. a, a responsibility there mm -hmm. as well. You know, I think one of the biggest responsibilities of the Mayor is to liaise properly with with um, London councils. There's 32 mm -hmm. boroughs in London. They have mm -hmm. an organisation called London Councils. Mm -hmm. It's a very important organisation to work with. You mentioned something there, the GLA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, tell us what the GLA is for everybody watching, mm -hmm. and tell us what you're going to change about the GLA. A lot of people don't realise that no matter what, no matter where they are in what industry, these things will affect them. So the Greater London Authority, I sit on the Greater London Authority, I'm a London Assembly member. Okay. In a sense, it's a separate body from the Mayor. Our job is to scrutinise the Mayor's plans and I'd argue we, we do that quite well. As Mayor of London, you don't have the power to give them any more power, but what you do have is the power to take them seriously is the power to actually listen to them. There's Labour members, Conservative members, Green members, mm -hmm. there's a Lib Dem member, uh -huh. two, well, UKIP come um, Brexit party members. I'm, I'm not sure what they're calling themselves mm -hmm. at, at the minute. Sorry, sorry, Sean, one sec. I need you to do something. Don't forget where you are, what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, I need you to keep that in your head now. I'm at Hangar Lane and I'm about to go underneath the North Circular. Yep. Hangar Lane Tunnel, we're underneath. It's all great lighting, lovely sounding 13 litre, 410 brake horsepower, Scania lorry, roaring through the tunnel, and we're out the other side. Now, Sean, if that was one of my old lorries, that would have cost me a hundred pounds. But this is the point, isn't it? Let me be very clear about this thing. We are talking about the expansion of the ultra low emission zone. I simply will not expand it. It will stop on day one. It's a terrible idea. Can I have that in, I've got it recorded. I was gonna say, can I have it in writing? But I've got you, this on record. Are you, you filming? You can have this in writing because it's in my manifesto. And let me tell you why. If you wanna clean up the air of London, you don't charge Londoners to do it. You don't charge business to do it. You use the money we have in London, the 19 billion pounds I was talking about. So what I will do is mandate that all of the bus fleet becomes zero emission. The bus, the bus fleet, yeah? The bus fleet, that's the equivalent of taking a million, 1.1 million cars off the road. The other thing I'll do as well, we make the black cab industry buy a very expensive vehicle. Yes, we give them some subsidy. I'll continue the subsidy, but I'm also gonna add an additional 6,000 pounds interest-free loan to help them speed up the adoption of that new cab. Because if they can do that, that will be the equivalent of taking an additional million cars off the road. So, so you're gonna help the black taxis as well. For me, you know, I've got a, I've got a black taxi in the cab. yard. I like for me, um, black taxis they're part of the history of London. If I'm in another country and I see a black cab, it's like, dun, 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 dun. so it's part of the history of London. It's part of the history of this country. So you're going to help the black cab drivers and it, look. It goes beyond the history. They're part of our future. The black cab industry is part of public transport. You know, they are able to take people with mobility issues to places that have a um, vehicles can't that's why they should be supported we mandate that they drive that that cab so we should help them afford the cab that's something i would do but the other challenge for black cabs and for you as well is how we use the roads of london so we've had all these ltns dumped on people it's in my manifesto to stop that to wind them back and only put in an ltn if the local people want it when we put in cycle lanes we need to make sure they're safe we need to make sure they're useful and we need to make sure there's a better balance between cycle lanes and road users Sadiq Khan has let it become a war. What I want it to be is a partnership. Cycle lanes are great things. Walking is even better. But what we have to do is make sure we don't have this, this crazy war where it's cycle lanes or cars. I think we can do that much more. You said about cycle lanes like it's a war, like it's cyclists against, mm. like the way like lorries have been demonized and stuff like that. You know, we went for a period where they said that you need to have Euro 6 lorries to go into the ultra emissions. Do you know what? it's less emissions and the lorries are safer because um, you can see that like, we have the door down there yeah. so you can see it's safer, I get it. But to tell us to all go and buy new lorries for emissions and then move that further back and then say you're gonna move it further back again. Uh, we have a couple of lorries but we, like, we physically can't afford to have all new lorries. Like we can't afford, like we won't but, be, but and, and there's, pl there's plenty of people who won't be able to do anything. Yeah, they won't most, be able to survive. Most businesses couldn't replace a capital asset this large straight away. And what it is, it shows you the mayor doesn't understand business. He's not business friendly and simply he doesn't care. What you need to do, I will help everybody move forward and get lower and lower emissions vehicles, but you'll have a cohesive plan, a roadmap 
so you can see it coming. I'm not going to turn up one week and say, right, brand new lorries, because that, that ruins your business. You've got to tell people what's coming years in advance so they can move to it naturally. Because remember, when I say business, I'm talking about employment. No action of the mayor should be putting people out of work. That's ridiculous. What would you say to cyclists who would who would look at Khan and say, well, he's implemented this for, cy for cycling, he's implemented that. What would you say to those cyclists? There's two things I'd say. Firstly, most cyclists cycle and drive and use public transport. Okay. The idea that you're just a cyclist or just a lorry driver, I think is where the war comes from. We all need modes to move, not only our souls around London, but business, aggregates, whatever around London. That's the first thing. The second thing is to say, this isn't cyclist versus driver. This is about how do we make the most efficient use of the asset we have in London. Of course, Sadiq Khan has turned it into a fight because that suits him. I want to turn it into something we will resolve. So yes, I will build cycle lanes. I'll build plenty of them. I'll build as many as we can build. But where do you want those cycle lanes? Where are they of the most use? Where do we have to have vehicles moved around? So for instance, we want homes in London. That means we're going to have to have plant and vehicles in London to build those homes. And what would you say to those people? I'm just trying to be impartial here. I'm just trying to get it out. What would you say to those people who said, oh, you're only saying that because your dad had lorries? Well, where do you want to live? If you're one of the 87% of Londoners who wants to own their own home, you need to give me the opportunity to provide you with that home. The current system under the current mayor means you will never have that home. He's going to build 80% of homes for rent. Now, people keep saying to me, what am I doing for renters? What I'm doing for renters is providing you with a home that you can own. The rent you pay now, you could be owning with that rent. That's what I want to do for you because that's what Londoners tell me they want. When you say um, 100,000 homes, are these, gonna, these homes gonna be shared ownership? Just help the people to understand. How, will they own it or do they own it after time? Or is it, just explain the, the policy, I'll, I'll how it works. I'll take a step. So it's using a shared ownership scheme. Yep. So you'll be able to buy anything from 10 to 50% of the home in your, in your first go. But the important thing is this, in the first 10 years, the owner, which will often be me, the mayor of London, will be responsible for all the maintenance. Ah, you have to yeah. scrape a deposit together. You've got to go buy a sofa, you've got to go buy a TV, yeah. you've got to go and buy, you know, if you like to have a, I don't, I'm not really into the flowers and all that, but you know, people want to have a nice vase and they want to have, you know, so you will handle the maintenance. Yeah, the maintenance will be taken care of by the developer. The wow. second thing to say is, you will be able to go up the staircase you know, and buy 1% increments if you want. You, you, may, you may buy 10% and stay like that forever, or you might decide, actually, I want to buy more and more and more as your circumstances change and you go up. If you sell the home, you have equity. So the 10% that you own, let's say you own 10% or 20%, that part, you get the equity on. That's how you save. So you get the equity? Yeah, and that's how I bought my first house. The house ah. I live in now, I was in a shared ownership flat, yeah. my wife and I, we sold it and the equity we used as a deposit for the house. There's no way I could have raised the deposit. Ah, so it acted to, uh, acted as a bank for you, bricks and mortar. Yeah. And then um, the value of the asset was going up anyway. Yeah. So you capitalized on your own saving, plus the way the market moved and you were able to get a deposit and now you have a house for you and your family. And the last thing to say, the shared ownership scheme that we're proposing now, the one that's national, will always be cheaper than renting the equivalent property. Because what will happen, if you own 20%, that 20% would be less for you to pay for than if you were if you didn't own any of it at all, if you had to pay 100% rent on everything. And of course, there's an added benefit that you are effectively building up savings as well. What will be the criteria for you to qualify for this? Londoner. That's it. You need to be inside the, the Greater London um, border, inside, which is nine million people at this point. <laughs> Wow. So I'm focused on young people, and by the way, young people's anybody be it below the age of 40. Like, one of the things about Asheville is the fact that you've actually tried to do something. And I say this to any young person, if you think life's on top of you, if you feel like you're always complaining, ask yourself, have, have you tried? Because a, I think the more you try, the less you compare, complain, and the more likely you are to be successful. I, if you don't try, you definitely won't succeed. And, and I think sometimes I watch young people on the internet and I just think I'm so, I'm so inspired by the fact they're trying to build a YouTube channel and they want to be a property developer or this, that and the other. Mm -hmm. I just think to myself, that is where success comes from. Success comes from ambition. But I'm not running for Mayor of London mm -hmm. because I want to be a politician. Look, mm -hmm. I'm always getting in trouble because I'm not some slick, well-measured politician. Mm -hmm. I want to do this so ordinary people think there's one of us there. I want to do this so that they can find mm -hmm. me and I can take responsibility and just be, be straight with people. Mm -hmm. If something's going to work, let's mm -hmm. do it. If it's not going to work, I'll say it didn't work. Mm -hmm. let's, let's be straight with people. 
I just want a London where people believe what politicians are telling. Imagine mm-hmm. you could believe a politician. Yeah, well, well, tell me something. How do we know that you're going to do what you say you will? How do we know? It's, it's two things I'd say, right? My whole life has been based on community work and anybody in community work knows you always come back and face the community. There's no hiding, never yeah, try yeah, to hide. Yeah, right? yeah. And the second, the second thing is my plan is costed. It's costed, it's measured so out. You, so you have a budget? I have a budget, I have a plot, and what it is as well, I'm not going to be doing this alone. I'm going to build the strongest team to run London we've ever had. Are any of these people you're building a team, are they in the current mayor's team? Cool. I just thought I'd ask, innit? That's a question. It's a, it's a reasonable question. The, the current mayor's team, there are some quality people in it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think sometimes they've had to respond to the politics that Sadiq Khan has laid out, so they've mm-hmm. done what they've done. I have nothing against them. Many of them I've worked with mm-hmm. because they were in City Hall and, and I consider them colleagues and they're decent mm-hmm. people. But I want to build a stronger, more dynamic team. I want a team that's spent more time out in, in, in industry, in the commercial world. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes politics doesn't deliver because it uses only politicians. Mm-hmm. I want people like... When Poli- I, politics doesn't deliver because it uses only politicians. Yeah, politicians. Look, my what I think is I'm a generalist mm-hmm. who's looking for specialists. Okay. I'm always looking to build a team. So I'm talking about helping small businesses, small developers. Mm-hmm. I've never been a small developer. I need to go and find one. What ah. are the challenges of being a small developer? I'm talking about setting up a project that's focused on reoffending. I know lots about reoffending because I've worked in that arena, yes. but I don't know anything about the college education side. I will go and get someone from FE to lead that project. I'm talking about making sure I have a deputy mayor for business who represents what big London business needs. I will get someone from the city or someone who's from a hedge fund or a bank mm-hmm. or, or who's built something in that world. There, that's how I will build my team to make sure I deliver. Constru- haulage? haulage? Haulage construction? Haulage. Do you know the big thing about haulage? It's slightly separate thing. We have an asset in London called the roads. We only use it eight, 10 hours a day. Why are we not getting consolidated delivery things? Why are we not using the river? Why are we not getting people to deliver at night where possible, where relevant? This is where you get the haulage industry in. Let's be clear, London is a footfall city. Without people in London, it doesn't work. People in London are going to need goods, they're going to need aggregates, they're going to need all that stuff. We're going to need to get the haulage industry to work in the most efficient, eco-friendly way possible. Um, you know my family's of Caribbean descent. Yeah. Yeah. My family is St. Lucian. Uh, we are in London. Uh, there has been a lot um, happening, you know, lately. There's been the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. You know, we've had a history of things like that. Um, I have to ask straight, you know, are you just going to be about Black Lives Matter? Are you appealing to everyone? Is that close to your heart? I have to get it out in the open. It's like the elephant in the room. Um, for me, it's not an elephant in the room. I'm for all people. So, so let me tell you about my history. So, for instance, my children are mixed race because my wife is, is, is English. She's born in Kent. I think people have more in common than they have in difference, and you've got to work for that. The Black okay. Lives Matter thing, of course I think Black Lives Matter. I'm black. Nobody needs to tell me that. But I don't wholeheartedly support the, the, that as an organisation because I think some of the things they're asking for are not correct. Like, they want to break up the nuclear family. I'd argue that the black community needs more nuclear family, not less, so there's a difference there for me. But this for me is about everyone. One of the best things about running for Mayor of London, I've been to see everyone. So just two nights ago, I was celebrating Pathandri, Tamil New Year, yeah? How do I know that? Later on this this week, I'll be going to Iftar. I've been to Hindu temples, I've got a big footprint. I've been to Israel, why? Because I work a lot with the Jewish community. Because I will make a London that's a crossroads to the world that works for everyone. And I know sometimes, like I live in Romford, big white working class community, and they are, oh my gosh, Sean gets it, he knows us because we're working class people. We know it's like we work for a living. I yep. get it. For me, it isn't a question of black or white, it's a case of right or wrong. Let's help those people. I've often been told off in the past because I've asked challenging questions about different communities, about how we all work together. My yep. goal is to bring us all together because at the end of the day, we all have the same issue. Yeah. Where do we live? Where do we work? Am I safe? Can I feed my children? Do I have a future? All of those things affect you. If you're black, white, green, mauve, Christian, Hindu, and all the faiths in between, or no faith at all. And I'm working for people, for a sort of a togetherness is what I'm after. We are in central London. We're gonna take a drive in and then come out. Now, I know that it's not your fault you didn't put the policies in place you know but if you're successful how long will it take you to withdraw the boundaries of this ultra low emission zone you know the north circular and then are you going to stop it going all the way to the m25 and crippling like businesses like mine 
And will you pay my congestion today? So I'm yeah. definitely not paying your congestion today. All right, cool. <laughs> um, the central congestion zone makes sense and will stay. The expansion of the ultra low emission zone and could do immediately because the election is on May the 6th. And if you haven't registered to vote, you should do. Just type into Google, help me vote or how to vote and it will register you. And that's the first thing. I can stop that immediately because it won't have happened and I'll just say no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's as simple as that, I'll, I'll just say no. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. So you're just so you're just saying no on the October expansion to the M25. But at the moment, driving my old lorries past the North Circular, are you going to get rid of that because that's already in place? What are you going to do about that? I'm going to stop that because it's adding to the cost of business right when we need business to work to rebuild our economy. Good. Remember, 300,000 Londoners have lost their job. Sadiq Khan has 300,000 Londoners. 300,000 Londoners. And he has to be able to look them in the eye and say he's done everything he can to save their employment. I don't think he has, I will do more to save the employment. And the first big thing is to lower the cost of running business. Remember, construction is, is generates a lot of jobs and I wanna make sure that that works. Let's have a look at this sign. What does that say, John? Ultra low emission zone. ULES, as we call it at work. I understand in central, W1, yeah. WC, I understand. Yeah. But the North Circular, like jobs that we were supplying within, we can't afford to do it now. If I add a hundred pound to a lorry a day, things are tight as it is. Nobody wants to pay more money for a load to come out. Yeah. And then it turns out that all the bigger companies then who can afford to go and buy all new lorries, they end up doing all the work. Yeah, that's right. That's and, then, and then the smaller company, what do we do? I tell you why small business is important. There's two big things about it. Firstly, most Londoners work for a small or medium sized business, over 50%. Really? Yeah. I know London is about big business. We have a lot of business and great and long may that continue. But most of us work mm -hmm. for a small or medium sized business. That's the first thing. And the second thing as well, a small business often is more likely to take a risk on a young person. Yeah. yeah you know, you, they'll give yeah. them two minutes, they'll, they'll, they'll nurture them, they'll look after them. And big businesses often don't have that capacity and small businesses do. That's why for me, small business is very important. I have to ask as well, what do you think your chances are of winning? Let's be clear about this. It's an uphill battle for me, but Sadiq Khan has failed awfully. He's failed on crime, failed on housing, failed on business, failed on the environment. And I have a plan for a fresh start, a 10 point plan and an absolutely brilliant manifesto. My manifesto is effectively written by Londoners. It's absolutely great. Now, Londoners are warming to it. As we get closer to the election, people are saying, yeah, we do need a fresh start, Sean. What are your ideas? And more and more and more people are interested in what I'm saying. And I'll say this to you, how many people on this video, even if you are a Labour voter, could really tell me you're enthusiastic about putting Sadiq Khan back, back in City Hall? Are you prepared to vote for our young people to be living in a dangerous London? Are you prepared to vote for no homes to be built? Ask the people around you, they're not interested, but that's why we stand a chance of getting this done. Yes, we are the underdog, but if you register to vote, we can get this done. London needs a fresh start. I've never voted, Sean. Here's your opportunity. Don't say I never give you anything. Oh, I, technically, you didn't give me the opportunity. Yeah, well, I, I suppose that is true as well. So it's true, it's true, it's true. Yeah, that is true. And there's lots of people who haven't voted. There's lots of people now thinking, what's this got to do with me? This has got to do with your cost of living is going up. You're no longer safe as you were. This is about you. And people live on the outer ring of London as well. Often think that's all happening in, 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 in their London. It's not. It's all changing for you as well. Register so, to vote, definitely. So I, I, this is what it comes to vote, and I think, nah, I ain't got time for that. How many people, uh, you know, I guess you know numbers, because you said it's not about percentage, it's about numbers. How many people in London aren't voting? Do you know that? Put it this way, there's nine million people in London. About five million of us are eligible, eligible to vote. About anywhere between two and 2.5, 6 million people 50% of people eligible to vote don't vote. 50% turnout is, it would, yeah, it's about right. 50% turnout? Yeah. yeah. It, go, it goes up and down, and, and but what, not much. And what would you say to someone like me who thinks, ah, it's not going to make a difference if just, if just I vote? i tell you what I would say. The best thing about a mayoral vote, every single vote counts. Because it's one big, giant constituency. So every vote counts. And it's easy to do. You can vote by proxy, by post. You know, you can turn up on the morning and vote. Is there an app? No, but there's a website. And what qualifies you to vote in London? You have to be... An EU citizen or Commonwealth citizen or a British citizen who's 18 on or before the 6th of May, and who, who, who doesn't need um, leave to remain. Um, it, if you then register to vote, so you have to be living in the Greater London area as well to vote. But all those things mean you can vote. Again, that means about 9 million people qualify.
Wow, okay, so th th this, I'll tell you, this is gonna be the first time. I'm not gonna tell you where my boat's gonna go. You know, that's, that's private. That's a person's private business. Yes, it is. But, you know, are you gonna vote? Yeah. Am I gonna vote? Yeah. I've heard of this guy called Sean. He's wonderful from all accounts. I'm gonna vote for him. You're gonna vote for him. Can you vote for yourself? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, I have a vote and I can cast that vote. Okay, but, and I have to ask Sean, I wish you luck. Mm -hmm. If you are unsuccessful, what will you do? What's your plan? Um, first thing, I'll go home and hug the kids. This has been tough for my children because I've been out of the home so much. Secondly, I'll just keep serving London. I will find a way to do public service, not just for London, for the whole country, but I will keep doing it. It's been my passion and my joy. I've really had a great time and I've met so many good people doing this. It's unbelievable. Would you try again? Who knows? Who knows what it I'd have to speak to my wife. Um, we're a team. If, if my wife wants to, then we would. That would be at least three years away. But I have no plan B. I only, I'm only focused on the 6th of May. <laughs> I, I, I know the feeling, mate. Yeah. There's no plan B. Yeah. I know the feeling. And if you were successful, be Mayor of London, would you, uh, would you look to complete a second term as well? I'd probably say yes. Yes. Because London's challenges are long term and new ones will arise and I have a plan to do it. And the whole way I've got around constructing my, my manifesto and the conversations I've had means that I have so many contacts, personal and business and organisation, think tanks, unions, everyone. I can pull all of those things in to answer any challenges we have for the future. So I'd love to keep doing it. Now, is becoming mayor, I know you want to make change in London and you're a Londoner. I can hear in your voice you're passionate about it. I, I have a sixth sense to be able to tell when people are yeah. trying to pull the wool over my eyes because generally people are doing it all day long. I tell you that I do believe you. I don't know entirely if you can do it, but I do believe that you genuinely want to do it. But tell me genuinely, we've seen Boris. It was kind of not used as a stepping stone, but he moved on to then become prime minister. Is that an ambition of yours? <laughs> I have to ask. I have an advantage over Boris. You know what that is? What? I used to work for the prime minister. I know what Oh, yes, tough. you've... You did just high work. drama job it is. So when I tell you I'm just focused on this, I mm. mean it. I know we were in the paper and you read all different stories about the PMs and all the rest of that, Labour or, or Conservative. It's a tough job. May I know it's obvious thing mm. to say, but what I, I saw it up close. It's like watching someone losing a boxing match every day and thinking, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be a boxer. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a tough gig, it's definitely a tough gig. Imagine in an ideal world, you're able to come in for your fruit for three years mm -hmm. and then four years. After that, w would you look to still continue to serve um, in a different capacity? What do you think you'd do at that point? Would you kind of sit back and have a look over a grateful galaxy like Thanos did? Or do you think you'd always continue to try and serve? I'd certainly always continue to try and serve. I don't know if, if I'd be best served the Mayor of London. It depends where the projects I'd, I'd started or gotten to. But I think one of life's greatest pleasures is to help the next person. Who could replace you? If, if you run any kind of business, if you're sort of senior and grown up and you're doing big things, try to build another version of you, a new, modern, younger, more hair, more teeth version of is, you. Is that what you're trying to do now with me? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Right, so we're on the way back to the yard. Mm -hmm. Have a look at the sky. All we yeah. can see is cranes here. We can see cranes, we can see construction. And we have Westfield Supermarket over there. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you're gonna do for retail? Or do you think by just stimulating the economy, people will have more disposable income and then it's just a knock-on effect? Before I answer that question, we've just also driven past Grenfell. And it's a real reminder of, to me of the importance of politics. I see it as the art of the can-do, not just arguing for the sake of arguing. And it just showed me the responsibility we have to make sure things like that don't happen ever again. I used to live near Grenfell. I, I worked with many people who lived in the block. And I remember the night that the block was on fire, one of my friends sent me a picture because he still lives there. And I, I, I'll never forget the pain and the hurt and the anguish when I went down to the area and started speaking to people I know. And I think we all need to work on that. And that's why keeping people safe always has to be the number one task of any person in power. And that's why you hear me continually talk about making London safer so that our communities are not suffering from crime and murder and drugs and all those kind of things. That's the first thing. Now, there's two big things I'd say about retail. Firstly, I just wanna get football back in London. Unbelievably, Sadiq Khan let London fall to the lowest 5% for football on high streets in the country. What that means is London retail spaces are just not as busy as they could or should be. So the two things I think we need to do that. 
A, I'm gonna make traveling around London easier, quicker. I'm gonna make sure that people feel confident about using the tube network. I remember in the beginning, the mayor said he wanted the lockdown, then he, he said he didn't want the lockdown and people were confused and just stayed at home. I'm gonna be very clear. I want people to come back into London safely. Let's use the vaccine program. Let's clean the network. Let's get people in. The best thing for retail is customers, number one. Number two is the general building of the economy. Remember, I'm going to create 924,000 jobs over a five year period. More money in your pocket means more money in other people's pockets because we spend in our economy and it goes round and round and round and things build. The other thing as well, I want to have a festival of London. So I wanna have a month long festival in London to attract people from abroad, from the rest of the country. A month? Yeah, a month long with hundreds of different events, theater events, park events, art events. Here's something you don't know about me actually. I love murals. I wanna have a London mural commission. We can just paint murals and beautify London. I wanna have gardening competitions so we can garden in public spaces. We're on a Saturday day 40 now and they've got mm -hmm. a grass verge. Mm -hmm. I mean, that verge could look a lot better. I mean, let's help people, you know, do their own areas, all kinds of things. Our theatres, our cinemas, our bars, our pubs, they need something to attract people yeah. back in. I want to do that as well. When, listen, when I heard festival, the first thing I thought about was carnival. So can you go into it a little bit more? It's not, yeah. we won't be just jumping not, up. Not, you and I wouldn't be jumping up and down with whistles in our mouth behind the behind the soccer float, would we? We may <laughs> well be, we may well be. I mean, I, 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 look, I, I went to not all carnival every single year. My granddad, my family used to have a big storm. We used to sell food. It's yeah. in my soul, it's in my blood. Yes, you know, they're not in all carnival, maybe a carnival elsewhere. London also has some of the best markets in the world. Yeah, Romford Market, Borough Market. You know, let's get these places in the minds, not mm -hmm. only of people in London, but people in the wider country as well. So they come and visit and spend their money here. I looked up what I wanted and what I think Londoners want. And then I worked backwards and I've tried to answer every challenge to make that happen. And I've tried to involve other people who are experts who don't always share my politics. It's very important that I've, I've had my ideas and my views challenged. That's very important. You said before, you said um, footfall is down mm. under Sadiq Khan. Would you say that was his policies? Or would you say that's just the way things generally have gone with the growth of Amazon and online shopping? Me personally, I don't like shopping, but I like to go to the shopping center, mm -hmm. go to the cinema, have something to eat. I can't stand in the sh people in the shop procrastinating mm -hmm. about something for half an hour and it's just, just buy it, innit? Just buy, like, it don't, yeah. just buy it or don't. But would you, would you say that was his policies or that was generally the way things are going? Look, I'm not one of these aggressive politicians. It's not his fault, but it is his responsibility. Now, you're right, Amazon happens. It's a challenge of streets. But what he should be doing is, is helping our high streets to do better and better and better. And I think he, he, he missed the opportunity. He just didn't take the time. And you said that your policies have been challenged. Who have they been challenged by? Oh my gosh, everyone and, and their uncle. Look, there's lots of people who just challenge me simply because they vote another way and they don't want me to succeed. And that challenge is good because they're not always wrong. You know, I've, I've had people from unions who've challenged my views around TfL, around roads. I've had lots of people who've challenged my views around removing the extension of the ULEZ, for instance. But that's politics. I welcome those challenges. I'll argue my case and I'll make my point. The best thing about the challenges I've had, 99% of people are reasonable. And they've come with a challenge, we've had a conversation, and I've, I've solidified my point on, and we've moved on. And my principles are strong but my opinion can be moulded. I'm not ignorant about politics. I don't believe I'm right about everything. I'm prepared to learn. So when you've had policies challenged, have you ever adapted these policies and thought, hold on a minute, he's got a good point there. I'll give you the most important point that my policy has been changed. We've had a lot of fire regulations changed because of Grenfell, because of what happened. There's, there's, there's um, leaseholders who are trapped in limbo because the rules have changed or not, we, we're not sure and that's really affected their future. I didn't want developers to pay because I wanted to, to get as much building in London as, as done as possible, because of course I want to build 100,000 homes, 500,000 pounds. But I had a group of leaseholders who came, made a strong representation, proved to me that I needed to change my view, and I have. I was halfway to where they were, and now I've gone all the way, and, and the basic line is the government should put as much money into this as possible, the government should pay, they are correct. And I used to be a leaseholder, and they they reminded me of just how intimately their whole future is tied up with that lease, and they were correct. And I changed my policy on that. I'm proud that I was able to listen to them, and I didn't let my own pride get in the way. Okay.
previously, you advised the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. So, if you were successful as Mayors of London, would you have to meet with our current Prime Minister? What impact would he have on your policies? And what impact would you have on what he was doing? Would you advise him? Do you report to him? For, for those people who, who don't know how this sort of thing works. So definitely you'd have to meet with him as Mayor of London because ultimately he runs the whole country. The Prime Minister has a massive impact as the Chancellor, as all ministers do, on what happens in London. So you definitely do that meeting. I happen to know Boris because I worked for him as well. I've worked for Boris on, on, on basically two occasions actually I've worked for Boris. I've, I find him to be quite reasonable and what he knows about me I come to represent what I come to represent. I would go there with London's intentions, London's needs, not his, you know. I'd, I'd like to think on 99% of things we, we would get an agreement, but if we didn't, I'm more than happy to fight with him. The best thing about being Mayor of London... So you're, you're more than happy to fight with him? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry, just for everyone watching, um, he doesn't mean for them to stand outside number 10 and fist it out. He means that they would have a discussion where they elevated their voices. Yeah, him and anybody else, because the best thing about being Mayor of London, you are effectively an independent. You, you're not beholden to... An the independent? Party. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, I'm a Conservative member, I'd be Conservative Mayor of London, but I'd be independent. That platform allows you to do what London needs. I relish the, 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 the opportunity to just take them on. I remember when I used to work for David Cameron, he constantly used to say to me, Sean, but we've decided to go another way. And I'm like, no, David, we need to have a look at it this way. And he always used to say to me, you're, you're very determined to argue your point. I said, that's right, I'm here to represent a particular thing. You, you don't have to accept it, but you know, this is where I'm coming from. You're actually, this is like the first time that you're actually making me interested in politics. Tell me something, I do well for you. You've been elected as mayor of London. You don't have the money to do what you want to do. Do you go to the Prime Minister? Or do you try to find it somewhere else? What do you do if you've got a shortfall of money? Are you going to tax the people? Are you going to put their, are you going to increase congestion charge? Are you going to put up their council tax? What do you do? Look, being Mayor of London is about making tough decisions. And when I talked about my principles, my principle, I'm a, I'm a conservative. I want to keep tax low. So that'll be the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll be doing. Do I go to the PM? Absolutely. But the difference between me going to the PM and the Chancellor is they will meet me halfway because I will have flexed the assets we have in London. So when I talk about infrastructure bank, Steve Khan could have set up an infrastructure bank five years ago. He has asked the government for £29 billion. They don't have £29 billion to give to him. I will have tried to raise some of that money using the asset we have in London. So, so for instance, when I tell you about a London festival, yes, it will be great fun, but it would be much more business rates to London as well. It'd give me, the Mayor of London, more money. I would be able to say to the government, we've used our monies to raise money in London, so you need to support us with that. And the point I want to make, if you're listening to this and you're from outside of London, remember, as Mayor of London, I would be spending my money where you live. I know when people talk about London, they all think that London gets all the goodies. No, it's not. Like, for instance, I would end up ordering 9,000 buses, zero mission fleet buses. We don't build better buses in London, but they do build them in Sheffield. They do build them elsewhere around the country. Ah. Do you see what I mean? The aggregates in, in, in these lorries, we don't, hey. we don't make them in London, but we, but we pay for them in London. So I want to build a London that, that, that prospers the whole country, and that's why you hear me talking the terms I'm talking. Jobs, 924,000 jobs, business, growing London business to answer the, the fight back against the lockdowns, COVIDs. And thirdly, employment, just making sure that Londoners spread that employment, not only London, but beyond. It's, it's about making the whole economy work. I think it's very important that people all up and down the country know that the policies in London will affect them. Yeah. Imagine you're a big fan of the NHS, or yeah. you like the fact that your local council, I don't know, sweeps the road, or your kids go to school. All of that is paid for by business activity, all of it. Every single penny of that comes from business activity. And that's the kind of thing that I'm cognizant of in, in London. And I, I just want people to be independent, mm. make their own choices, and that means they need anything. You touched on the NHS there. Mm -hmm. Does the NHS have anything to do with you? Is it anything, any part of it within your jurisdiction? Or There's not really any part that the mayor can control, except the mayor has a health arena that says he has to look at inequalities in health in London. So poorer communities, older people, people of colour have different health outcomes. His job is to look at how can we equalise them. And I, I, public health is a big thing to me. I used to be on the board of a hospital as a trainee. I learned a lot while I sat on that board. And if you look at the COVID outbreak, yes, it affected the black community, but it also affected the white working class community. White working class men who had to still go to work died at almost the same rate as well. So I think 
when I talk about health, how I will change the game is to talk about health promotion, health preservation. We wait till people are sick to fix it. I want to help people keep maintain good health and also mental health as well. Mental health through lockdown has been a big thing, definitely. It has. Talking about the NHS uh, makes me think of the emergency services. Shout out to all the emergency services. We appreciate how much you do. My best friend Paul, uh, both his sons are my godsons. He's a fireman. Okay. And I think there's this new policy called LTN. Oh, okay. And he's saying there's fires and he can't get the fire truck down the road to emergencies. Listen, what, what, what's up with that? So LTN's low traffic neighborhoods. It was okay. a good idea, executed very badly. And Sadiq Khan, execute the idea because the money go through TFL and they approve or not and what it is they built they tried to make a, tr a neighborhood have no through traffic and all the rest of it but they've dumped them on local people a lot of these LTNs people don't want for instance emergency vehicles can't get down there they can't get their own cars down there and it creates even more traffic on the main roads which means there's more pollution because cars are sat idling for a long time because they're in traffic so what I'm proposing is we stop the LTNs we take out the ones that simply don't work and we only put them in if a community wants it. In many cases, a community said we don't want DHL, it's been forced on by the council. A group of residents called me to, to Redbridge to show me how bad their LTN was. So there's this giant flower pot put in the middle of the road just off the E12. So people are turning, finding a roadblock and then having to back out onto the A12. People in Ealing have mounted a, a case against their local council who simply won't look at them. A woman said to me, it used to be a five minute drive to school and back to collect older parents and back. It's now a 35 minute drive. She said the traffic is so bad along the main road that she doesn't allow her children to walk to school that way. They have to walk on a route that's about 10 minutes longer. And if they had just asked the local people they would have said no and here's why because she said this was always a low traffic neighborhood this was unnecessary same thing in Dulwich they're having a big fight about it in Dulwich as well there's a march happening in Dulwich actually and one in Ealing against the, the LTN and I just think we should listen to local people more because particularly in this case they are correct it's not achieving the goal it's set out to achieve I've actually learned a lot. I, um, I think all our all our viewers will definitely learn a lot. Uh, they like me to have interviews with interesting people in different fields. Uh, you said a word there, March. Nothing to do with you, but uh, we had um, some protesters arrive at at our yard, and they tried to shut the yard down. Um, it's in regard to a large government infrastructure project where we're delivering material. We're not a main contractor. Uh, we didn't authorise it, we're not paying for it, we're not an avid supporter of it. However, we're just delivering material. We're a local business, I employ a lot of people, I've spent a lot of money on infrastructure, on rent, I've taken a lot of risks, I've put everything on the line, and the protesters turned up in our yard, blocked the yard, caused havoc, started rioting with the police, a number of them were arrested and they ensured that we couldn't make any money that day and they threatened members of my staff. Um, they, they, I don't really like the ways in which they address me, which I, which I won't go into now. What is your take firstly on large government infrastructure projects, ones which are planned? Let's talk about Heathrow expansion, which is planned but hasn't started, and then other government infrastructure projects, let's say um, HS2. What is your take on both of those and what do you think about protesting and how people go about doing things? Let's separate these things out. So Heathrow, I'm, I'm anti Heathrow. I don't think it's gonna give the big economic boost they say it will and it's gonna cost you Londoners, in fact the whole country, an awful lot of money. Big infrastructure projects though are great for the country. Yes, be clear about that. They generate an awful lot of economic activity and remember what I really mean is jobs. They generate an awful lot of that, so they're really good for the country. It's one of the key ways we, we should rebuild after COVID, the effects of COVID. The thing about protesting though, of course you should be able to protest, but you shouldn't be able to disrupt people's livelihoods. We saw with the Extinction Rebellion, it closed down London for days. That's, the, that's the and I remember I, I was stood on a bridge speaking to people from Extinction Rebellion because I wanted to understand their issues, right? And a guy walked across the, the bridge, he was carrying a big arm mitosaur. And he said, Sean, get these people off the road because I don't get paid unless I work. So I said to the woman, your issue with, with climate change is real and correct. She said, yes. But I said, do you understand that you're losing people because you're taking their, their, their livelihood away from them? And I wondered if people turn up at your yard, you do all this disruptive stuff, are they, are they helping their case or are they destroying their case? You know, 
you've got to bring people with you. That's why when I talk about my environmental policies, I don't just tax people. I try to find ways that we can use our collective spending to move the dial on and bring people with us. Everybody wants to save the planet if you speak to them for two minutes. But you, you don't have the right to come and disrupt someone's business because, of course, that's how they feed themselves. And that's just not right. And I'd ask people, if you're going to protest, absolutely. But do it peaceably. Do it, do it better because people will then join you. They won't oppose you. So you're not for the Heathrow expansion? No. I, look, economically, I, I don't think it delivers what they say. The noise is going to be amazing. It leads to hundreds of thousands of fights a, a, extra a year. And I can't see how the economy will benefit from it. All of this, of course, was before COVID broke out and, and changed maybe, the situation for the... Maybe the extra run runway will bring people for your festival. Let's hope they come here by a different means. You're, you're completely right. <laughs> but we, we already deliver enough people into the country by, by flight. Let's see. But of course now, nobody knows where it's going to be because how will the airline industry be built after lockdown? There is that. Yeah, they're under a lot of pressure. I wish them luck. After lockdown, COVID, I don't think people understand what's actually going to happen when a lot of them come off furlough. There's going to be a lot of people being made redundant, which I don't think they're, I don't think they're aware of. And there's been a massive deficit built through paying furlough, through supporting businesses, through doing all of these things. Um, is, that, is any of that recuperation cost landed on, on the Mayor of London? COVID has really affected our economy. In London alone, 300,000 people have lost their jobs. I am so anxious to do everything we can to replace that employment, hence my plan to develop all these jobs. The unfortunate thing is, because of the way the mayor approached economy and business before COVID broke out, it's going to be a bit harder to rebuild the economy, but I'm confident we can do it. The country's in pretty good shape considering what's happened. You know, it's not the best shape, but we've had a very tough time, we can get through it. But let's just see, it's, it's going to be a, a hard... It's going to be a hard moment for the country. But is it going to be put on the Mayor of London to try to recoup any of the money spent? Or is that, is that a government issue? That's a government issue. That's a government issue. Yeah, yeah. So, some of the costs has fallen on councils. Yeah. And, and I, I have sympathy for councils because okay. their finances are tight. We're, we're getting back to the yard. And um, touched on it earlier, telling people to vote. Um, a lot of people have a look at things saying it's unjust what's what's happening, this shouldn't be happening, that shouldn't be happening, this isn't right, that isn't right. So we're saying, Mayor of London, every vote counts. Every yeah. vote counts, every vote counts. Look, the, the thing is, right, if you're sat at home now and you've had a laugh, but you and your mates don't engage in politics, you never vote, but you complain how the world is changing underneath you, that's why it's changing, because you're, you're not voting. Like everybody who says, go on, Sean, I want you to win. They, they're a plumber. I had a bin collector say to me the other day, a guy who works for the council, cab drivers, people who, who, who drive Uber, you know, people who work for a living. The point is this, right? If we want the world to change, then we have to vote for the things we want to happen. Be the change you want to see. I'm running for Mayor of London. They've attacked me at every turn. I don't mind because I'm trying to make, I'm trying to be part of the change I want to see. Why don't you do the same? Go out and vote on May the 6th. The minute you vote, you start thinking, actually, I'm going to do it again and again and again. Form the habit of voting. It's really important. It's really important. You can help the world be the way you want it to be and not just keep suffering from these changes all the time. Sean, we're just getting back into the yard now. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to come here. I very much appreciate you getting back to us and spending the time. I know you're a busy, busy man on your campaign. Stuff like I, wa I watch, um, I watch House of Cards, so I know, <laughs> I, I know what, I know what the campaign, what the campaigning is like. So I want to thank. It's not quite that glamorous. It, it, it's not, it's no. Not <laughs> no, unfortunately. <laughs> but look, thank you. It's been great to speak to you. Speak to your listeners as well, and I'd say get out, vote on on May the sixth. Give London an opportunity to have a fresh start. I know you probably noticed, but go backwards, yeah? I don't want you to, like, imagine you get hurt.